Hey everybody, and welcome to The Void, a show dedicated to filling the void between being an employee and becoming self-employed. Most people refer to starting your own company as taking the leap, as if they're blindly jumping off a cliff and into the unknown. This show is here to help you understand that it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be a leap at all. We will share with you the process that I used for starting my own company so you too can be on the way to starting your own service-related business. We'll work through some common issues that are preventing you from starting your company and fulfilling your true potential. As always, if you like what you're hearing on the show, please do us a favor and help share the void with someone you might know who is also interested in starting their own company. Dave and I just saw an opportunity to help others understand that self-employment is within their reach. And just as our businesses have grown organically and by word of mouth, we want this show to be the same way. And it takes two things for that to happen. We have to put out some great content and you have to help us share our valuable message with others. We know that many of you out there are on different social media groups for your various trades and skills and crafts. Uh, These groups are begging for this kind of info virtually every day. So if you see somebody ask a question about starting their own service-related business, please do us a favor and drop a link to the show. I'm your host, Mitch Smedley, and with me as always is David Hilton. Mitch, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to get into this one. The last, <clears throat> the last one we we did, and this one are we're really starting to dive into that important stuff. Yeah, and we're not, you know, I, I don't want to say fluff because the first few episodes are not fluff, but um, this is the meat and potatoes. We're getting straight to the heart. that I like. Yep. So let's let's talk about the adversities that we've gone over in every episode. You know, we've talked about what they are. Um, preparation steps is three adversities. Number one, personal finance prep. That's episodes one and two. Mm-hmm. If you're just getting into the show, go back and start at one and catch up to where we are now. Right. Okay. Preparation step two, business finance prep. That's what we just did on the last episode. Right. That's episode three. Yes. That's episode three. Systems prep. Episode four, five, and six. It'll be episode four, five, the and six. The meat and potatoes. Yep. We're at episode four. This is when we start getting into the nitty gritty. Yep. Okay. And those are the those are the preparation steps. We've broke those into three. So after that, we're going to get into the beginning steps, the beginning adversities. Okay. So number four will be community involvement work. Uh, five, wake up, do work, repeat. Six, evaluate performance, make adjustments, and improve. And we, when we get into those, we'll start really breaking down what you know each one of those is. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you've listened to the other podcasts, which you should, um, we break those down just a little bit in the beginning of each one. We're not going to do it now. It's, it's a little more repetitive, but right. if you go back, you'll know what those are and then we'll get right into them. Yeah. And, and the main reason we broke them up into preparation steps and beginning steps is because you need to be working on the preparation steps together and you need to be working on the beginning steps together. Do not work on the beginning steps while you're working on the preparation steps. It's going to hurt you in the long run to do that. You need to prepare to start your business, and then you need to start your business. You don't want to be kind of starting your business while you're still trying yeah. to prepare. So um, things that we covered in the last episode, um, uh, one, of, one of the things that, that we covered was, was uh, talking about business finance preparation and how we're going to fund that business. Yeah. And, and one of the options that we talked about was 401K. Um, you're talking about borrowing against your 401k. Well, we didn't really dive or into cashing it. out your 401k. Right. We didn't really dive into it all the way. So no, we didn't, we wanted to kind of recap a little bit on that section and kind of go over, like hit that again to, to talk about with you guys that there are two avenues to get money from your 401k. One is you can borrow against it. And the other is you can cash it out. Yeah. What are the differences? So, um, borrowing against your 401k. Okay. $50,000 is the max or 50%. Whatever's lower, whatever's lower, whatever's lower. You can borrow that money. Now, when we say borrow, you are taking a loan out on money that is it your money? Of course it's your money. But you have to pay that money back Mm -hmm. and interest, okay? So you need to vet out, what is my personal max? Can I get the 50000 
You know, you need to. Do I need the 50? Yeah. Are you 100% vested? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're only 50% vested. You might not be able to borrow, and or, you're, and or you, you're yeah, you're, be you you think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get sixty thousand. I can, I can borrow the max fifty. Well, I'm only fifty percent vested. No, a lot of times if you're, you're not twenty five, you just cut yourself in half because you're not vested in that money. Yeah, a lot of times if you're not fully vested, you can only borrow your input into it. You can't borrow at all, any of your employees. Exactly, and they are different. The, Some yeah. of them are different. Yeah, yeah, you case know, by case. Exactly. So you'll need to you'll need to either talk to your HR department. Yep. If they have one. Um, your personal accountant or um, or just do the research in your state right based on what's happening right. with your personal account and then the other one is cashing it out um, and w what was that it's uh, you can cash out uh, up to a hundred thousand or your entire account balance whichever one is smaller right yes. And let's talk about taxes on that. Yep. So if you do do that. And penalties. Yeah. You have to pay taxes and penalties on that money. Yep. Now, they let you spread that out over a three-year period, but you are losing a substantial amount of money. The, the penalty gets deducted before you take it out. So it's, a ten, yes. it's, it's a, usually about a 10% penalty. So just using round numbers, if you're going to withdraw 50 grand. So just stay at 100 for for easy easy math. Yeah, okay. So if you're going to draw withdraw 100 grand, you're only going to net 90 right off the get-go. And, and then, then you have pay to pay taxes, taxes on, that. on on the full 100. Yes. You're yes. paying taxes on the the full yes. amount, right? So Yes, plus penalty. <clears throat> right. That's a lot of money. It gets and, expensive. And that's why we talked about in the other episode um if you can avoid doing that, that's yeah. the smart thing to do. This is this is kind of like a last resort. It, it's in a, my opinion. It, it's, it's a, a last, last resort. resort. However, if it's the only resort you have, then you might not have anything to do to entertain it. So exactly. Um, I have a friend of mine. Uh, he, he's not a friend. He's more of an acquaintance, but I still follow him on social media because he is incredibly uh, inspiring. <clears throat> he about 10 or 12 years ago, he cashed out his 401k to start a, a restaurant and a micro microbrewery. And I'm, I'm sure he was warned and it would be risky and everything else. Well, where yeah. is he at today? He's got three locations. He's soon, oh, like he's constructing his fourth right now. He has an event space. Uh, they have their own line of like over 20 beers that are distributed all over the world. And uh, we're located in the Kansas City area. The Kansas City Airport is going through this big giant revamp. And he was just blessed with the opportunity to plant a uh, – the, the, the company that I'm talking about is Martin City Brewing Company. And he was just blessed with the opportunity to plant a Martin City Brewing location in the new airport, which mm -hmm. can you imagine how many hundreds and hundreds of businesses and restaurants were aspiring for that? And he earned that spot. So all of that started with him cashing out his 401K. And uh, he made it work. So yeah. that put a lot of pressure on him to perform, but he understood his vision. He understood where this thing could go. And so, and he knew the risk of cashing out his 401k. And so he put all of his chips in and, and it wasn't a gamble. It was a calculated risk. And he came out the other side, very successful. Yeah. So, and, and that can be, uh, very risky. It, it, you could lose it all. Yeah. Okay. But we you have to have perspective on that risk. Right. So when someone says we and I'm sure you don't know the numbers, um, but when someone says I hey I cashed out my 401k, that could be twenty five thousand bucks. Right. That could be a hundred thousand dollars. You know we don't we don't know in that specific situation. So even though it may be ex it, it could be extremely risky or not so risky because maybe it's not that much money. Right. Maybe you, you were a if you've got seven hundred grand in your 401k and you're going to cash out a hundred. That's that, not that big of a risk to you, right? But the no. topic of cashing out your 401k seems risky. Yes. However, it's not it's not a majority of your retirement. And sometimes it's about perspective. Yeah. You know, for one person it may seem completely extreme, and right. for the next person it's like, "Oh, that is completely feasible and I can do that." Right. And to him, he could do that. Right. And he did it and he made it happen. Well, he knew it was going to be in his own mind's eye and in his heart, he knew it was going to be successful. Yeah, his vision, his, his vision millionaire mindset. Yeah, his millionaire mindset of I can do it. I'm going to do it. Get the hell out of the way. Yep. It worked for him. Yep. Before we get into the, to the, to today's topic, um I wanted to to talk about ethics and honesty for a few minutes. Um, we might get into it right here. Yeah. 
Um, there are a lot of people out there who want to start their own company for the wrong reasons. And those reasons usually revolve around greed or the love of money. And the sole purpose of them starting their business is to get more of it. Money is a great thing. However, wanting more of it and solely only wanting more of it as a, as a purpose of you opening your business is a giant problem. Um, if money is the sole purpose of you starting your own company, that that's that's not what we're wanting for the intentions of this podcast. There's a few misconceptions about money, though, that we do want to clear up. Pursuing money directly is wrong on nearly every level, but uh, th that means you don't care about your customer. It means you don't care about your people that work for you. It means you don't care about your community, right? Um, even the Bible states that for the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, we don't want to get biblical, but... This, we're talking about writings that were 2,000 years old. So this is not a new concept. Ultimately, we're talking about greed and selfishness. Uh, greed is the intense and selfish desire for something. The key word is selfish. So if you hope to start a business or create a company or create wealth um, or offer a service to the community and greed is your driving force, please do not subscribe to this show. And if you already have, please unsubscribe to this show. <laughs> We would hate to hear that the people that are listening to this show are using our great advice and taking it out there and using it for selfish gain. If you do a little research on virtually anybody who built a wildly successful company, you'll usually never see greed in that aspect. History shows over and over that the most successful business owners out there are selfless. They are not selfish. Now, listen, when, when he says that, um, you know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, my boss is a selfish turd, yeah. you know, and I know guys that are completely selfish and they have been extremely successful. We're not saying that every successful person in, in the entire country is not, uh, again, there's every successful the person isn't selfish. Yeah. There are guys like they're out there like that, but we want to, um, we want to focus on people that are more like-minded, yeah. I guess I should say, yeah, 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 and have a good heart. And when they, when they use our advice and are successful, we want them to be uh, pillars in their community. Yep, not just selfish jerks. Right. That's what we mean when we get into that. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm very aware of my behavior when it comes to being selfless or selfish, and I'll be damned if anybody has the grounds to call me selfish. Um. I attribute a lot of my success to that one simple fact. I'm selfless. Uh, Simon Sinek is is a pretty popular mentor and, and leadership uh, mentor. Um, he's got some great stuff when it comes to being selfish, selfish or selfless. Um, he says that leadership is putting the needs of others before your own. And it's not about being in charge, but instead leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. And think about that for a minute. Is that a quote? I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a quote from Simon Sinek. Okay. Um, think about this for a minute. This guy, Simon, he mentors some of the world's greatest leaders, and he bases the foundation of his teachings on the ideas that leaders put the needs of others before their own. So even though you're thinking about starting a company and you might be the only employee, you're still a leader. You lead your customers every day. You're leading others in your community every day. So if you want to even be the slightest bit successful, your job is to put the needs of others before your own. If you do that successfully, the money will come. But getting in the mindset of success is putting the needs of others before my own is, is where you need to be. This doesn't mean you're doing things for free or breaking your back every day and not being paid fairly. It just means that when you're faced with the question where there are ethical and unethical answers, that you choose the ethical answer every time. That is part of the millionaire mindset. It is. You it know, is. And, and we always, and, and as we go, you know, through this journey of these core episodes, the millionaire mindset takes on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've talked about, go back and listen to episode one, two, and three. I mean, we hash it out pretty good. Yeah. This is another example of the millionaire mindset, taking care of others yep. and, and doing the right things in your community. Yeah. I can't stand when people who call themselves professionals 
uh, lie to customers. Yeah, it drives uh, me crazy. And and they'll do it because they're going to make a few extra bucks. They're greedy, right? Um, they'll lie to customer. Like, let's say it's a furnace, and they'll lie to a customer that the furnace is old and it can't be repaired, or they'll lie about the safety of the furnace in order. And, and what they're hoping for is they want to sell them a new furnace instead of fixing the old one because they make more money selling them a new one. Exactly. I can't stand it. The right way to handle a situation like that, where you're presenting, like you're identifying uh, a customer's repair or replacement needs and that kind of stuff. If, if your business is going to be, you know, service where you're repairing and fixing things, the right way to handle that is to offer the customer options and your professional opinion. So you offer them a repair option and a realistic repair option, but then you also offer them a replacement option. Repairs typically come with shorter warranty periods and cheaper price tags. Replacement options come with better warranties and higher price tags, right? It's your job to offer both of those options and then let the customer choose what option is best for them. First of all, you'd be surprised how many customers go ahead and choose the replacement option anyway because they're not dumb and they want to make the right choice. Yeah, and that and, and when they do replace, that gives them peace of mind. Yeah. You know, right out of the gate and they don't have to worry. Yep. And and, and you giving them those options, you know, it's almost like it takes a weight off of your personal shoulders. Yep. You know what I mean? You know that in your heart you gave them the two best options. You gave them your professional opinion, which is based on 20 years of experience, yep. and then they got to make their own decision. Yeah. No matter the outcome, right? You know, you feel better, they feel better. You've done the right thing, and you know, I'm not a big um, yin and yang guy, right? But you know, what you put in is what you get out, right? And right. it's you know, and I don't, I, you know, I said yin and yang, and I'm not a big karma guy either, but. You know, it's amazing how often those things come back around. Yeah, yeah. Everything that you put out into the universe is eventually going to come back to you. So when you lie to customers and tell them that replacement is the only option, well, they might just ask you to leave and they're going to go get a second opinion. They're going to come find somebody else, right? Now, what happens when that somebody else comes in and says, oh, I can fix it, and they get them back up and running, right? Well, now you're getting ready to get like a bad review on Google yeah. and you're going to get lit up on social media and all kinds of stuff because you are dishonest and you're a scam artist and all of this kind of stuff. So uh, in today's day and age, people, 20, 30 years ago, people could not tell other people about bad businesses. No. Businesses could scam people to death. to death. And who are you going to tell? Your closest friends? Right. Yeah. And that was the BBB. That's why the BBB right, right, right. got got out and rolling, but, you know. But nowadays with the, the the advantages of social media, people can go to the masses very quickly and talk about people and businesses very fast. Yeah. And and this works both ways. They can talk about great things, but they can also talk about bad things. So, um the the simple way to avoid all of this is to provide them options and mix that with your professional opinion. And be honest. Right. And ultimately, that's what it they're paying for. It comes down to honesty. Yeah. They're paying for your professional opinion and your honesty. So give it to them. And if they choose the cheaper option, that's great. You owe them the best repair you can give them. Right? Uh, just because the repair is done, um, guess what? The customer is 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 going to do that night. They're going to talk to their friends and say, well, yeah, they, they, they talked about fixing it. They talked about replacing it. We couldn't really afford replacing it. So they fixed it and they were awesome. Yeah. And now they're bragging to their friends about you. Yeah. Right? Even now. though even though you did what you did not want to do. Right, right. Or, and I shouldn't say that. Maybe you thought repair was the best option, but you gave them the replacement option also. Right. Because that's just being a good steward. Right. You know. But what happens is when you do the right thing, now your customers are advertising for you. Now yeah. you now now your customers are cutting down your advertising expenses because they're bragging about your business to everybody. And and when we talked about earlier in the other episodes about um, we're going to teach you how to get word of mouth business, this is one of those points. This is exactly one of those. This points. is one of those points. So um, when you let, I mean, everybody's been bragged to about a company, right? You we've all had oh, our yeah. friends be like, oh, I had this garage door company come over and they were freaking awesome and they took great care of me and everything. Well, guess who I'm going to call now whenever I need a garage yeah. door repair, right? Yeah. So, and when, when that comes, because that referral from my friend who I trust 
that that friend was so excited about that company. Now, when that company comes in and they make suggestions, you to trust me, them. I immediately trust everything they're saying. Yeah. So because of the the power of the referral from the friend. Exactly. So we, we bring all this up to make sure you guys know early on in this show that we are serious about honesty and ethics. We are serious about reaping rewards that come when you are honest and you are the best. You can't buy the kind of advertising that comes from those heavy word of mouth referrals. Your business will explode with nearly zero advertising expense simply because you're honest and you're the best at what you do. Now that we've got your head in the game, let's roll into preparing some of the systems that you're going to operate from for the life of your business. These systems are your roadmap to success, and without them, your business will fail, and without them, you will fail. Ray Kroc did not just wing it when he decided to open the first McDonald's. He put some systems and processes in place that would help ensure his success. There is a process for every step in that business, and because of this, McDonald's can be found all over the world, and their systems and processes are synonymous in every single business, every single location. Um, there's, there's tons of examples of systems and processes right before your eyes, Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Amazon, Whataburger. I mean, they're all there. You can go to three different Chick-fil-A's and you can get the exact same experience at all three of them. And all three of them will tell you it was their pleasure. Love me some Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Had it for lunch today. Chick-fil-A baby. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> for some reason, I always crave it on Sundays though. I don't know why. Because you know, they're closed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember it. I'm like, yeah. oh, crap, they're closed. Yeah, it's subconsciously. Right. But you want what you can't have. That, that's, a, that's actually a really good example. They're beating the market averages, and they're giving every other restaurant out there a one-day head start because yeah. they're only open six days a week. F them, right? They're like, yeah, you know what? Right. So, and you know what? It's, that's what happens when you operate your business in a highly ethical and honest way. And they're taking care of their employees. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That yep. That is a, an employee first environment. Right. For sure. Right. So, um, the thrill of being a business owner really kind of comes down to the thrill of being prepared to be successful. So, if you're not success or if you're not prepared for success, business ownership is not all that thrilling. Uh, it can be very stressful, and, and you're going to come up with a whole bunch of excuses on why you ended up not going into business. And it usually just comes down to a lack of prep. So the first um, system that we're going to talk about is your price book. Ugh. This is the Ugh. most, it's the most important Ugh. system for your business. Um, your price book is your Bible when it comes to business. It holds the answers to almost every problem you're going to encounter in the field with a customer. I've never seen a failed customer with a solid price book. Um, a failed customer? Failed business? A, a failed business or a failed company. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you for correcting me. There. You're welcome. Um, those who invest proper time and energy into their price books usually understand how important they are. Nearly every single successful business has a price book. And sure, some of them look different, but they're all in place. A fast food restaurant, for example, their price book is their menu, right? Yeah. That's, you know, this much food for this much money. Uh, Jiffy Lube. Their price book is also a menu, and it's hanging on a sign above the counter good, in the lobby. Right? A good example: menu doesn't have to mean food, right? You know, right? When it's I go menu into pricing. if I go to Sports Clips and get a haircut, when you walk in, guess what? They're yeah. labeled up there. Yeah, that's a menu. What Sham do I want off of yeah. that? Yeah, haircut thirteen bucks. Haircut plus shampoo nineteen bucks. Right? That's their price book. Yeah. Um. So they they provide the company and the employees the go to price for everything that they offer. Um. Let's discuss. Uh, so for the home service business or the commercial service business, um, one of the common debates is going to be like flat rate pricing versus time and material pricing. Yes. Let's, 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 I don't like price books. Okay. And, and when I say I don't like price books, I don't like when, in the old days, it's not like it was, it is now. So... <clears throat> And when I say the old days, you know, I'm talking 15 years ago, you know, literally in the guy's van, there was a book and he would flip it open and it would say, this costs this much money. Yep. And I hated that because I knew in my mind when I got to the job and I looked at the job, I knew that's going to take me this many hours. That's going to take me this. It's going to cost this much. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my, the price that I had up here was better than the price book price. Yep. You know what I mean? And a lot of, I don't want to say older people, 
you know, but handy men, you know, guys that have been around, you know, they don't like price books. Right. And, um, you know, one of the first big companies I was at, I, I shouldn't say big, modest sized company as I was at, was out in the sticks just a little bit. Um, and those customers hated price books. Yep. You know, and that was kind of just ingrained. Yeah. It was more of a big city thing mm-hmm. at the time. And so we are going to, and when I say we, I'm going to make Mitch break down why it's a good thing versus time and material. And, and then as he goes through that, we're going to hash out, you know, um, what the big differences are mm-hmm. and the discrepancies between what I thought and what you thought. And, and why it works now for a person going out on their own to do it. Right, right. So the biggest the biggest drawback to time and material pricing is it's very difficult to win on that setting. Um, and this is whether you're really good or really bad. Uh, and this is whether you're a business or a customer even. And so what I mean by that is... Let's say you have two employees that work for a company and they both make $20 an hour. And those employees are set out to do the exact same task. If one empl- if employee A does that task in five hours, the customer gets their problem taken care of in five hours, the employee made $100, okay? They charged the customer five hours of labor. If employee B takes eight hours, to do that task. Now the customer's bill went up because employee B was slower. The company charged the customer more. So now the customer might not like the company as much, but then also employee B made more money to do the exact same work as employee A. So who got rewarded for being worse at their job? Employee B, right? He made 160 bucks for doing the same task that this guy made in a hundred or made, made a hundred dollars doing. So the, the wrong employee gets rewarded there. The customer pays a higher bill and the company is going to suffer because now they're charging more to the customers. So that's why in, in the home services industry, that's why I don't like time and material pricing because it rewards the wrong people. Um, flat rate pricing on the other hand is going to be for this repair, we charge this much. And it's the same price no matter how long it takes. And you're, you're basically playing a law of averages. Most of the time it takes this. Sometimes it's going to take longer. Sometimes it's going to take less. But the customers got consistent pricing. So if they talk to the neighbors and they say, oh, yeah, I paid this for that. Oh, I paid the same thing too just three weeks ago. So there's consistency there. But then also you're typically going to incentivize your guy off of some kind of uh, incentive for that task to where your guys are making very similar money. But if one guy does it in five hours and one guy does it in eight hours, well, now this guy made the same amount of money as this guy and this guy's home three hours earlier. So he's actually getting rewarded for doing better work. That's why I like flat rate pricing over time and material pricing. And as an employee, you know, that's a great benefit. Yes. You know what I mean? As this is a massive benefit. Especially if, and, you know, it's sad to say, I, I shouldn't say sad because everyone is different. Right. Different people do different things. But it does reward the go-getters yeah. that are going to probably, when we've talked about this before, that are probably going to leave you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, but while they're there, they're being rewarded for what they're doing. Yeah. And, and we're going to dive into this in future episodes for sure. Like, we could talk for hours Oh, there's going to be some Q&A stuff. on this for sure. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I've worked on my price book, but I don't think my numbers are right. Right. You know? So... One of the key pieces to building your price book is going to be working on a spreadsheet on your computer. And this, I'm just going to tell you up front, this takes a lot of time. So we're going to give you a real high high level overview for how to build your price book. Um, But the, the key thing to remember is this takes a bunch of time and it's worth it because it's going to set you up for success later Um, because it's going to provide context to your pricing. So If you're not familiar with Excel, watch some YouTube videos and learn how to work well with Excel. Knowing Excel, we'll just just sidebar here. If you can take the time before you do this stuff to sit down and actually learn how to make a good spreadsheet, it will save you time in the long run. Absolutely. And once you have that information in there, you don't have to keep trying to 
pull that information from your brain. Right. You know, and this sounds stupid that you're freeing up brain space, but I mean, once you get so many numbers out there and so many jobs and all that different stuff going on, yeah. I mean, it, it makes it so much easier and you can call up, I, I don't want to say secretary, receptionist. Mm-hmm. You can call up the receptionist and say, hey, I need this information. My laptop went down. She can get on the same stuff. Yeah. And you know, and we're going to talk about that in the CRM section, but yep. um and that's it the benefit it, to having a price book is it its makes consistency. It, yeah, and it makes it easy to to pull up information when you're using that spreadsheet. Yeah. So like the the price book that I operate from, um, it's a, it's a bunch of columns and a bunch of rows, and and one of the columns is like our task code that we would use for any given task, and we have a task code for literally everything we do in the company. Um, it's about four hundred tasks long. Um, What's a task code? So like when a, you say task code, explain to everyone what you mean by task code. Like a task code for for me, it's going to be different for everybody, but for me, it's like a six digit number that's got a series of numbers and letters that that helps organize all of the repairs that we do. Um, and there's there's a lot of theory into those numbers and where we put them and how we organize them because there's some kind of hidden language in those codes. So my first column is my task code. My next column is my repair name. It could be my trip charge for coming out. It could be augering the main sewer line. You know, again, I was doing, I'm doing a plumbing business. Um, It could be replace the water heater. Uh, It it could be anything. Any, any service that you offer can be there. Yeah. Let's talk. So if it was a lawnmower company, so in task one, maybe uh, there. Mow only. Well, yeah, it could be mowing. And then the next line could be square footage as a multiplier of the yard. Yeah. And then the next line could be trimming. Yeah. Maybe you you, you get your large broke down into like small, medium, and large, or maybe you've got, you know, 10 different sizes. Yeah. And then you could go off of, um, you know, trimming and then a multiplier on trimming. Right. Like, um, you know, they have so much landscaping that the multipliers, say you have a one to five scale of difficulty. And, you know, this these people get a, got a three yeah. and if it's this many linear feet of landscaping, edging. then it's yeah. Edging it's um, you know, it goes to a multiplier of three, right? J- just as an example of, of different things, you know, we don't want to get stuck. Uh, not everyone listening wants to be a plumber, right? Right. But, right. You know, it just, just to open your mind's eye of, of what those different things could be. I mean, haircut. Yeah. You know, you, you could have you a know, couple of different levels of haircuts. Yeah. Women's haircuts, X men's, <laughs> X coloring cut and X. color. Yeah. Coloring cut and style. She wants two colors, you know, times 0.02. Yeah. You know, it could, all those different things can go into that spreadsheet. And that's why, um, we said just a second ago, if you can sit down and learn how to do that spreadsheet and listen, don't feel overwhelmed. You can go on YouTube and, and learn, learn how to use Excel to the point where you can be really good at it yeah. for these simple tasks. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're not, not running a complex. hospital here. Yeah. We're not talking complex stuff. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't even have to be Excel. Google Sheets can is, is another great spreadsheet to use. Yeah. And we're so. not telling you to use one or the other. Yeah. yeah but yeah. whatever you decide to go with, spend a little time, be good at it, and it's going to help you in the long run. Yeah. Another cool thing you can do with those like repair codes. And, and so like on mine, the customer never sees the repair code. They just see the task title, right? So they see replace water. Yeah, they don't care what the code is. Right. (laughs) So I use the codes to help send some hidden signals to myself and our guys in the field. Those codes, um, they'll have some extra numbers and letters in them to help the guys understand how they're paid for those tasks or to help the guys understand how much time is included in those tasks. So, for instance, like if we're going to repair a drain line, we might have – three or four different levels of a drain line repair. Well, one might have a half hour of time built into it. One might have three hours of time built into it. And so we'll kind of throw some numbers in order in those codes to let the guys know this one includes a half hour and this one includes three So like hours. a nomenclature. Yeah, so like... So if the fifth, if the fifth uh, digit or so like, letter well, over is a three, if that's a three, that dictates three hours. Like So my task code for a drain line repair is it starts with DR for drain repair, and then the next four digits are, is the code for the amount of time that's included in that. So it might be DR0050, and that tells the, the, the technician that there is one half hour of time built into that. 
And so if he thinks it's going to take him about a half hour, he would pick that one. I've got another one that's D. If he D. thinks it's going to be an hour and a half, he's right. times in that by three. What, or, yeah, he could he could take that one times three. Or we've got another one that is DR150. or It's DR0150. So that tells him it is a one and a half hour drain line repair. Um, and, and we scale those up. Like well, I've got one that's DR1000, 10 hours for a drain line repair. Right, it's going to take him a long time. Like we're replacing all the drain lines in the house or something. Yeah, you're you're gutting a basement. Yeah, set of pipes. So so we can use those codes to kind of give some nomenclature to the guys so they understand how they're better paid. Um, we can even add like little spiffs and carrots in there. So like for instance, if you're a salon owner, what do you and, mean by spiff? Uh, a spiff is like a cash payout for anybody who performs that task outside of their normal wage. Oh, so, okay. Like a bonus. It, it's a bonus. Yeah, it's a little bonus. It's a little carrot. A little thank you. Um, if you're a salon owner and you're really trying to sell, get your people to sell shampoo, your code for that shampoo, $3 spiff, right? It might be your funny code. And then you have like a decimal point and then like one five after it. Well, that decimal point would indicate that everything after that is a, is a spiff for your salesperson. And of course, this is all so oblivious 0. to the So would be 15 15 bucks. Yeah, right. I got you. So if now you for, say, for color, that's a lot, but I, I get the gist. Well, of, like, yeah, if you sell a $100 bottle of shampoo, you don't want to pay your people 15 bucks First to off, sell it. First off, if my wife buys a $100 bottle of shampoo, I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah, I, I just don't ask because <laughs> I would lose my mind. You're just in den- yeah. denial at this point. So... Um, the other cool thing about setting your price book up on a spreadsheet is it gives you the ability to modify it very quickly. So, uh, your flat rate pricing is built kind of off of your billable hour price. Um, and so if you want to charge $200 a billable hour or whatever, whatever that price may be a hundred dollars a billable hour, all of those cells that are factoring your price are t- multiplying, you, you, you may have a column for how much time is included in the task. Yeah, you're summing that column. Yeah, and then you've got up in like one corner of your spreadsheet or somewhere on your spreadsheet, you've got your billable hour. So that if you ever change your billable hour in the future, all of those formulas automatically update your entire price book. And uh, Yeah, and it's handy. Yeah, so literally. You don't one, have to sit there and go column by column, uh-oh, changing this. Right. And then next you gotta, Tuesday, you had to do it again. No, Right. you just go in there and boom. Takes yep. on the whole deal. Exactly. And that's why it's really important if you're going to use a spreadsheet, get right. it learned and right. know what you're doing before yeah. before you get too in-depth. And and so we hit on the hourly rates, like understanding your hourly rate. Go to your market what you, for, for wherever you're going to be doing work and the services you're going to be doing and start learning about what those services cost. And you can help, de- you can help develop a good hourly rate. Um, I hear people all the time talk about taking your overhead and you got to understand your overhead before learning your hourly rate and all that. And I get that. However, when you're new in business, your overhead is squat compared to some of those big companies. Hopefully, yeah. That does not mean you need to charge squat compared to those big companies. The customer is going to pay for the level of service they're receiving. And so you may be the smallest company in town, but if you're delivering the highest quality service and the best customer service, you need to be charging the highest price in town, even though you're a one man shop. So, and and again, I'm not telling people to go like blow their pricing out of the water. Yeah, he's not saying, you know, I'll just give a a personal example. So I have an HVAC background for 20 years. When I went out on my own, I mean, I knew what our our, hourly rate was, Mm -hmm. but I... I immediately called everyone. Yeah. Within and I shouldn't say everyone. I maybe made 10 calls yeah. and I said, you know, I I asked different things. Hey, what's your service call rate? Yeah. What's your hourly rate after that? Um I you know, and then I'd call the next company and I'd say, "Hey, my capacitor went out." And and some what of you them guys call for that. Some of them won't give you prices over the phone, but you'd be amazed how many will. A lot will. Yeah. A lot will. And and you're not, I mean, you're not cheating them. No. All you're doing is trying to find out the What's the base, going rate for stuff? The base of where everything is at. Yeah. Now, and and I'm not going to say, like Mitch said, be the most expensive guy. I'm not going to say be the cheapest guy. You need to find out where you need to be yep. based on all of those different prices. And you can base some of your price book off of that stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can you can make enough phone calls and ask enough questions to get a really good basis of where you're at. You know, I get that question a lot. Um, I, I got a buddy that's an electrician and um, he doesn't know. So where he works, he doesn't know what they charge, you know, for different things. He just goes out and does the work. Right. Okay, it's not like... 
your plumbing company, um, where, where those guys have a really good idea of what it costs. Right. So, uh, I'm going to piss you off here and say, so when he does side work, <laughs> you know, he calls me and says, Hey, what did you use to, you know, you know, charge for this? And if I don't know, I say, Hey man, call up to beep and yeah, yeah, yeah. ask them, Hey, this is my problem. I had right. a bid. What do you guys charge for that? Yeah. The, so I, I mean, that's a common thing I see on a lot of internet forums and stuff like that is, Oh, what do you guys charge for this? And the guy's trying to develop his price book. The problem with asking the nation is because prices are greatly different across the oh, nation. Oh yeah, California, California service line run out, and where we live is completely different. Yeah, yeah. You so, know, um, you, you got to be checking your prices in your local market, exactly. And, and you want to be you want to be kind of in the ballpark of your local market. So, um, <clears throat> another part of building your price book is the parts lists that go into that price. So, and this again, this applies to everybody. Um, it applies more so in your your serve like your your trades fields your mechanical fields for yeah. sure yeah um but you can use your uh, you can have a whole nother tab in your spreadsheet for all of your parts where you can assign every part a number and every part a name and then every part can have like the the pay, the price that you buy it for from your vendor you can even have you can even list what vendor you buy it at and then you can teach your spreadsheet how to mark that material up to develop your sales price because yeah. you're always going to sell stuff at more than you bought it for yeah, um, that's why you try to buy things at wholesale. Right. That's what wholesale is. Yeah. People don't realize that now. It's yeah. you know it used You're to be buying a big it at thing. a wholesaler. You couldn't go to a wholesaler and buy unless you had a unless you had a license or unless, yeah. yeah right. Well, now, unless you had an account. Yes. Right. And now it's a lot easier. You know, with with Amazon and Home Depot and you know, all that, it's a lot easier. Yeah. People so. go into Ferguson and Ferguson will sell them. You know, whatever. Yeah. You got the handshake deal going, but you know that. And that makes it a little tougher, but but you can develop those prices based off of that. Yeah, and and if your price list is or your parts list is fairly small, you can kind of manage that yourself. My parts list is ginormous, and and it is it is astronomically large. And so what I do, I don't manage it myself. Like I, I've got the spreadsheet built, but I'll copy that and I'll email it to my salesperson at where I buy all my plumbing stuff, and I'll tell them, please provide me updated pricing for all of these. And yeah, they, and they'll go through line by line on all those five hundred different parts. And it's their job, and they'll give me all of the new prices. And then I simply copy that and paste it right back into my spreadsheet and it marks it up for me and boom, I have all current pricing. And so in this market today, where, where we're filming this podcast today, pricing has has moved around a ton oh, over the last year and a it's half. It's insane. And so that's been really helpful. Yeah. I can email it and in about a week, I get it back and boom, here comes everything. Yeah. So, or, or you could set it up. I know a couple of guys that do this. They will just, it's not every week, but it's I think twice a month. Yep. They'll automatically update, you know, he'll send that salesman will send him an email that says, Hey, these are the prices on the things that we, that you sent me that you stock in your truck, you know, and, and, and they'll just automatically email that to him and he can review it, you know, and if he needs to make adjustments, yeah. you know, based on that email, he can, I, I have a question for you as a, um, I don't do, pl you know, side plumbing or, or anything like that. Say you're out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and your price book is based on a certain thing and you don't have that and you can't get a wholesale price and you have to go to Home Depot and buy yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Do you just eat that? Yeah, most of the time you're just going to eat it because that's, that's again, the purpose of flat rate pricing is you're staying consistent pricing to the customer. And so if I make a mistake and it takes me longer, I have to eat it. If I make a mistake and I wasn't prepared and I didn't have that part of my truck, I have to eat that too. So that is like flat rate pricing benefits the customer more than it benefits anybody else. Um, and, and customers are conditioned to flat rate pricing. It's not like they, they go to the restaurant and they say a steak is like anywhere from 27 to $43. It kind of depends on who we have back on the line, because if it's Johnny cooking tonight, it's going to be $43 because that dude is slow. Yeah. Right? Unless you're eating seafood. So let's, so I like a lot of lobster and stuff, but it's by the pound and it just says on there market price, market price. Right. Okay. Right, right. That's so a little just, different. Yeah, it's a little different, right? But um, love so, me some lobster. I'm, I'm kind of an Excel geek and like I take my price book to the next level and I have like all of my repairs, I have a suggested level of pricing into my repairs, uh, a suggested level of parts, so to speak, into my repairs. So in doing that, um, uh, you know, I know that this repair is going to use one of these parts, one of these parts, one of these parts, and one of these parts. So when I update my material pricing, it automatically updates my flat rate price to yeah. adjust that price to account for the inflated cost of material. Summing so, a column. Right. Got to learn that Excel. Yeah, it's it's just it's just making your your spreadsheets work together. So 
you, your price book's going to take some serious time to put together. I mean, I've got yeah. hundreds of hours in building mine. However, now that it's built, it's, it's pretty over. It's over. It's automatic. And it's bulletproof. I'll have it forever. And I can always adjust it and, and make tweaks here and there. It's it, I, I never adjust the functionality of it. Yeah. So um, another thing about price books is yours is yours alone. It, do not share it with anyone. I have a copy of Mitch's. If anyone wants to buy it from me, my email is. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Once you complete your book, you're going to feel a certain rite of passage, so to speak, because of the amount of time you've invested into that. Only business owners build a price book. So this is a big time level of progress as you're putting together your business. Um, the, the more time you spend on it, the more passion you're going to get for, for success. Once you complete your price book, you're going to realize how proprietary all of that information is. You're going to feel a great <clears throat> sense of pride too. Yeah. Like, oh man, you know what? I can do it. Yeah. I've got this part done. I've I've worked through the first, you know, three the first two adversities, three episodes. I'm here. I got my price book done now. Right. I'm I'm getting to the top of the mountain and I'm almost on the downhill slide right. of, of really getting something going here. It, your price book is like an NFL team's playbook, right? They're not going to share that with other teams. That's that's their that that's their gospel. That's their book that they run their entire organization by and it determines their success or failure. So the better their playbook, the more likely they are to succeed. That's why I'm so I have yours for sale. I yeah. kind of wanted to ask a question on this, but yeah, I yeah, yeah. Got, like we haven't let's I'm just going to say something right now. We haven't brought Marcus in. We've been yep. rolling pretty hard. Producer Marcus back there. Uh, Marcus, what is your question? So what about those guys who are they're like, OK, I know I do good work. However, I don't want to charge them or afraid to tell them how much they want it. Are you, are you talking about so um, they know that you're just getting out on your own? And you don't feel that sense of big business yet. Right. And you feel like I'm ripping them off because I don't have a lot of that overhead and I don't have a lot of that stuff going <laughs> on. Down, you know, you do here's, so so, here's, so how do you how do you explain that where I'm gonna ask Mitch, so I'm I'm just kinda rehashing the question. Yep, yep. How do you explain that to yourself? And um was the question just, just you're just trying to explain it to yourself, really. No, guys right? that are afraid. Guys that are afraid. Yeah, guys that are afraid to charge what the market should be charging. That's a great question. And 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 if 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 you have low overhead, guys can be a little fearful of that. Here's the thing: you're not charging a customer based off of your overhead. You're charging a customer based off of the value and the level of service they are receiving. It's that plain and simple. If businesses you, choose their overhead. So you're saying if you know that you're supplying the same level of work, the same level of expertise, quality of work, you shouldn't feel any... You should not feel at all Don't feel ashamed, ashamed that you're charging the same price as anyone else, okay? E exactly. If you're doing the same work, it doesn't matter. And now listen, that's... Man, that was a good question. Because yeah, it's, it's so, an excellent question. So when I was on my own, I was a one-man shop out of my garage. Mm -hmm. I charged the same as everybody else. Yeah. And I didn't care. Right. It didn't bother me. You know what? It did bother me a little bit in the beginning. You nope. know, if you, you know, I was, you know, I just thought, you know, maybe in the back of my mind, but I knew that if I didn't charge that, right, I was not, I was, I was doing myself a disservice. I was doing my family a disservice and you know, sometimes people are paying when when you say you're paying for good service and good work, they're paying you for your knowledge, right. not necessarily the actual physical work that you're doing. Okay? You've put that time and all that energy and you you have learned all those skills. Yeah. They're paying you for that. The the easiest way to understand this is businesses choose their overhead. Businesses choose to go buy the fancy building. Businesses choose to inflate their overhead costs, and then therefore they are choosing to now have to, to charge pass that more. cost on to the customer. Well, it's always the thought in the back of your head. You're like, okay, well, if I tell them this price, then they're probably going to run away. You, well, don't be ashamed. You're, just, you got to be give, confident in your price. Yeah. Give the, give the price. That's it. And listen. Know your worth. If, if they do... Um, 
turn you down for a sale or a, you know, a whatever, don't take that to heart because that happens to big companies too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter who you are. You're going to get turned down fairly often. Yeah. Be so, who you are. I, I love that question. Yeah. Um, next up on the list of things to talk about is our customer. Where, where are we? Are we in the CRM? Yep. Customer okay. Relationship Management System, or your CRM, okay? Um, and CRM he's talking is, about software here. Yeah, this is the software that you are going to plug all your customers' information in. This is the software that's going to run your schedule. This is the software that's going to you're going to upload your price book into, and it's your, kind of your point of sale system. It does everything surrounding your customer relationship management. Um, research them well. Ask around and find one that works best for you. Some of these softwares are incredibly cheap. Some of these softwares are incredibly expensive. Um, speaking in the terms of the home services side of things, um, I use a software that costs me about $200 a month. It's 210 to be exact. There are softwares out there that will do a little bit more than mine does, but they charge six to $800 a month. Ooh. There's software out there that will charge $300 a month per service technician that you have in the field. And so I have three service technicians in the field. I'm now paying $900 a month just for access to this software. And so that's not realistic. One of the things that you're going to find is the more time and the better you time you spend building your price book, the cheaper your software becomes. Because a lot of those companies that are charging a boatload for their software are banking on the fact that you need their help to build a price book. And and if you if you want to pay them that, that's up to you, I guess. But again, businesses choose their overhead. I wanted to choose a lower overhead so that I can keep my prices reasonable or make a little bit more money. Whereas other I'm, I'm competing against other companies that are using that really expensive you, software. You were looking for a value yes. software. Yeah. You, you weren't worried that necessarily what the price was, but you wanted to stay at a good value number. Yeah. And yeah. when you're starting out, you know, this is a little off topic, but um, finding value in things is, is really a skill yep. that you will learn over time. Yeah. You know, trying to get the most bang for your buck is Un really important when yeah. you're first starting out. Understanding where it's smart to spend money and where it's smart to not spend exactly. money. Exactly. So um, here's a list of things that you're going to want to know, like demand that your CRM will do for you. You talking criteria? Yeah. Okay. Um, make sure that any data you put into that CRM is, is data that you own. Some CRMs will actually chart, like if you were to change companies and change CRMs, They'll, they won't give you your data back. They won't give you your customer base. They won't give you your any, any. They won't give you any reports or anything, right? So make sure that you own the data that you're putting into that. Um, you want your CRM to create professional-looking invoices and estimates. Um, Poor-looking estimates are a great way to lose those jobs or lose repeat business. Yeah. So um, you, you're going to want your your CRM to export to your accounting software. Whatever that may be. For me, it's QuickBooks Online. For you, it could be Peachtree. It could be QuickBooks Not Online, the, the standard QuickBooks version. It could be anything. Yeah. But and they're almost all going to, and we'll talk about this later, they're almost all going to the online now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you have to pay a fee. I mean, there's there's pros and cons for that. It's 35 bucks a month. I mean. There's nothing. pros and cons. Yeah. I just, it drives me crazy because yeah. I had the old versions where you just bought the disc, download it, and yep. now it's like all of a sudden that's expired and they're like, oh, hey, by the way. You got to go online. We're getting you for another $35 a month. It just yeah. <laughs> drives me crazy. The, the last but thing they, you, they need to talk to each other. Yeah. The last thing you mm -hmm. want to deal with is headaches on on getting your, your CRM and your accounting software, your bookkeeping software to communicate to each other. Um, um, you're going to want your CRM to create a really good, a really clear schedule for you. Um Everybody has to work from a schedule. And so you're going to want your, your schedule view from your CRM to be very clear for you to understand. So do some demos, check a couple of them out, and make sure the system works with how your brain works. Yeah, and ask other guys yeah. in, your, you know, in your field, I yeah. guess. You know, hey, I use this. Yep. You know, someone else may use this. And, and not everyone is going to need a CRM. Not everyone. You know, uh, I mean, I mean to, if, to you, a point, if you're like, a lawnmower, like we talked about earlier, and you don't have that many yards, you may not need it. But when you get big and have six or seven guys 
you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. running their own trucks. Yeah, you might, you're probably going to need it. And and like QuickBooks kind of functions as a small CRM a little bit. Yeah, it does. So so you can kind of use that to get started. However, like I wanted to jump right into a CRM because I wanted to be I wanted to be grabbing all that customer data from day one. So yeah. um, you're also going to want to make want to make sure that your CRM will import your price book uh, very quickly and very easily with just a few clicks. So this is huge because I keep my price book on an Excel file. I upload that into my CRM. If I need to make a change, I change my Excel file and I upload it to my CRM. And so within a few clicks of a mouse, I've updated my pricing and, and it instantly goes out to all the tablets so that the guys are using and everything else. So uh, you want that to be seamless. Yeah, that stuff needs to be integrated. Yeah. Um, you're also going to want your CRM to be able to allow you to run your phone or run your business from your phone or a tablet or a laptop, whichever you choose, like it's, all of them. And, and especially if, if you're new and you're answering the phones every night, yep. you need to be able to, that needs to be able to work on your phone. Yeah. So like our CRM allows us to work from a laptop or a phone or a tablet. And so like if we, if my wife and I go out to dinner and our business phone rings, we can literally answer the phone at the, at the, I mean, we don't always do this, but sometimes wait, if, well, let's it, say we're in the car waiting for dinner, but it only takes five minutes. You right. can, that's, we can answer the phone yeah. and we can book that call from our phone or our tablet. Like, like I can answer the business phone and I can pull out my personal phone and I can book a job for tomorrow. Yeah. So and that's all because my CRM is awesome. And that's really important because every phone call is potentially 10 more phone calls. Right. You know, and, right. and when you start not answering the phone and not, um, taking charge of those calls, right. you're losing business. Yeah. Um, you're going to want your CRM to be cloud-based. Um, and the reason why is, um, servers are really expensive. And so a lot of things are evolving to cloud-based and that's kind of what you're paying for your monthly fee on your CRM. Yeah. You so, really need that redundancy. Yeah. I mean, one of your kids, you know, sp <laughs> spills a two liter on you right. know the computer at home. Yep. You need that information. Yep. Um, the, the, the last thing that you're going to need to demand from your CRM is that it can run reports for you, like sales and marketing reports. Uh, those huge because that's, again, it's a later step, but that's how we learn where we're performing and where we're not. And basically, I use my CRM to find out what's working, and then I double down on that. And I use my CRM to find out what's not working, and I'll look at it and quickly analyze, can I fix that or should I just give that up and go back to doubling down on what is working, yeah. right? So um, your CRM will be able to tell you a lot of that kind of stuff. Here's some things that you can, your CRM can also do that's kind of fun. It doesn't have to do this. I don't, I don't, I, when you say it's kind of fun, these, these next items are just as important as they, the scheduling services they, they and that other be. stuff. They, yeah, they can be. It's mm -hmm. just it just depends on how you want your your business to operate. But for guys that are unfamiliar with like what CRMs do, here's some fun things that they do. They can text your customers that you're heading their way. Like they can literally text the customer a photo of the person heading their way and a little bio and all of that stuff. So that that way, when the guy shows up at the house, the customer's not feeling like they're dealing with a stranger. It makes you look so much more professional. Yeah. They can send those, they can send reminder texts like the night before that, Hey, just reminding you of your appointment tomorrow at four. Um, they, uh, they serve as a constant contact style marketing system. They're saving all your customers' email addresses. So you can export those and you can email every customer what you got going yeah, on. Yeah. And they're on the cloud. Yep. You know, you always have them. I, this yep. next one, I love the track equipment model, serials and ages yeah. within the home. That is, <laughs> that is invaluable yeah, for yeah. those of us that used to do it by hand yep. on work orders and then have to pull up another Excel sheet yeah. and load all that stuff in there so that we knew where it was when we needed it. Or before you can, that, we used to just keep paper files. Right. So we would just, you know, all that stuff went together and then it was in alphabetical order in a fire safe. Right. And then if you needed to look, you had to go and look at it. And now it's like, oh, boom, it's right here. Right. And, I just type can, in their name, search. You can track and it just anything. Pulls it up. You, I know. It's you great. You can track that, okay, the customer's got a 19 year old furnace. So we got to be, we got to send the guy that, that's better at working on 19 year old furnace. Exactly. Right? Um, but it's not going to be a flame sensor today. Yeah. Okay. You can also track. You know, hey, we put in a new unit last year, and so we got to send the guy that's that's maybe he's not as skilled. So we're going to send, you know, there, there's less likely to be problems on a newer unit. So uh, we can or send, major problems. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, major problems. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can that, you can but... literally track anything. You can you can track that the the customer's dog's name's Scotty and make sure you greet him, right? And that's great customer service. That's excellent. Yeah, you know. And that we what did we talk about earlier? We were going to tell you how to. 
do advertising without doing advertising, right. that's another thing. Right. When you go to someone's home... If you walk into the door and, say, and you greet the dog before you greet the homeowner, you oh, have dude. won a customer for life. Yeah. Right. Every time. Yep. Every stinking time. Now, if they have so, a cat, I'd kick the cat. Right. I'm just, I'm just kidding. So, but yeah, it's, it, it's amazing. Right. It's amazing. They can also process credit cards and include photos of tasks and, and do a ton of other stuff. So um, I have a lot of experience with a lot of different uh, platforms, but I have found uh, the one that works best for me. Um, you might be wondering what it is. I'm not going to tell you because it's not our job to steer you one way or the other. No. I found one that works awesome for me. And we're not going to find try. one that works awesome. We're for trying you. to give you, we've said it before and we're going to keep saying it. We're trying to give you the information yep. that best suits, um, your situation so that you can make the best decision for yourself. Right. The last thing we're going to talk about today is about being the most professional person out there. And we've talked about that already. Yep. Just just what we were talking about CRMs. I mean, you know the dog, that's professionalism. Right, right. Your customers are expecting a professional, so make sure you give them one. Act as if you've been in business for years, even if it's your third day in business. Act like this is something <clears throat> Act, Act like you're, it's something that you truly care about. Yeah. it's th This is your passion. This is what you are the best at. Make sure your customer knows that, okay? Um, you, th this, this requires like a mental shift in order to be the most professional. And this is not faking it until you make it either. Because the moment you walk away from your employer, there's no turning back, okay? You can't fake it at that point. So in a sense, the moment you walk away is the moment you've made it Yeah. in your mind. You're not successful yet, but you're self-employed at that moment, and that's a great start. So um, I want to tell you a story, and, and I actually saw this on TikTok the other day. Freaking TikTok. Um, but it's, it's a great story. You young kids <sighs> and your TikTok. Yeah. Um, so there was once a kid who was failing out of junior high school and cutting class all the time. Uh, the kid made a promise to his mom that he would take the SAT test before dropping out of school. He took the test and he scored a 1480 out of a possible 1600. His mom assumed he cheated, and so she went to ask him about it, and he swore he didn't. But something magical happened. Now that he realized he wasn't a failure, he started attending class, and he quit hanging out with the losers that he was used to. He went off to college. After college, he became a successful magazine entrepreneur. Twelve years later, he received a notice from the SAT testing agency that he was one of 13 test scores that year that were delivered wrong, and his actual score was 740 out of 1,600. So now people ask him if he feels like a fraud since he wasn't actually smart. He said, people think my whole life changed when I got the 1480. But what happened is my whole life changed when I started acting like I got the 1480. The moral of the story is that you will become what you act like. So start acting like a professional and start acting successful. This is this, this is, is the being, millionaire mindset. Yes, this all is, over again. Honestly, I wouldn't even say act like like you really embody. Yeah, you're living it, right? You are it. Yeah. So you you. This is being very real with yourself for how you're going to stick through all the ups and downs, knowing that you will indeed one day be successful. Start acting more professional in everything you do, your routine, your conversations with strangers, everything. Speak professionally, act professionally, and be professionally. And you, you can't... you. That doesn't fool anybody. You, speak, you are, speak success and you will be successful. Yes. Yeah. This is so that you can't fake this, right? So um, that's the mindset that you need to embody. You we are talk already about, successful. We talk about the millionaire mindset all the time. Yeah. We keep bringing it's it up. It's just another attribute of this it. This is another attribute of the millionaire mindset. That That's actually a good story. I'd never, heard, I'd never heard that story oh, before. Yeah. Did you make that story? No, no. I heard it on TikTok, actually. So, you know, as, oh. we, as, we, as we've said before... A lot of this TikTok. 
a lot of this information that we're giving you, we're just kind of regurgitating a lot of information we've picked up over the years. So it's not, it's not, and we're not like, taking credit for it. No, we're no. sharing the information that's already out there. And, we're we're and sharing you a, the pertinent information and you just need to start your business in just a condensed form. And that yeah. millionaire mindset, that story, you know, just, you know, the will to change your own mind about what's going to happen is huge is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And you can overcome a lot of things just by doing that. Yeah. So that kid had a strong case of placebo effect, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The placebo effect's real. Yeah. So guys, uh, remember that if you like what you're hearing on this show, please do us a favor and help share the void with somebody who might also be wanting to start their own company. Um, we saw an opportunity to help change a lot of people's lives and, and add some value to it. Um, and, and so we, we decided to put this podcast together to get this information out to as many people as possible. You can help us do that by helping share this show. So please do that. And, and we will get this information to a, a wider range of audience. And, and we promise that we're going to keep giving you some rock solid content that is really going to change your life. Um, we really appreciate everything that you do to help us share the show. And uh, until we see you guys next time, have a great week. All right. Love you guys. We'll see you.